Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar on the FSC Policy for Association Remediation Framework. Uh, we're glad to have you here and participate in this, um, in this uh, webinar today. My name is Amparo Arellano. I'll be moderating today's webinar. And we have uh, in our team Salem Jones, who is the program manager of dispute resolution, and Anna Jenkins, who is a consultant participating in this project, and they will be presenting on the uh, remediation framework. We also have Alex Green from our dispute resolution team who's also supporting us today. Um, next slide, please. So the main objective for today is to really um, engage you as a stakeholder. We wanna make sure that you have a high level information on the FSC uh, policy for association remediation framework. Um, so today is a general information level of webinar and uh, we want to make sure that you have an opportunity to provide feedback, ask questions, uh, and really engage and provide us uh, your comments and potentially concerns about this process. So we really want to hear from you. And what we want to accomplish today as our expected outcome is we want to make sure that you are well informed about this process and that you understand what are your opportunities uh, in this process to provide feedback to FSC. Next slide, please. Um, so just for you to know, uh, we are recording this webinar. Uh, it's going to be provided in the FSC website afterwards as a recording. So if you don't want your image to be shown there, uh, feel free to turn off your camera. And we will be sharing this uh, recording with you afterwards, um, also proactively with every participant in today's webinar. Next slide. Um, housekeeping rules so that we all really understand how to engage and ask questions. Um, we have the chat panel. You can raise your hand if you want to talk uh, to the group and share your comments. You can also put your comments in writing in the chat box. We will be checking that and giving the, the word uh, to participants um, as, as the comments come and the questions come. If you don't want to you know, give your name and you wish to stay anonymous, you can just uh, send me a message privately um, and also to the presenters, but ideally to myself to concentrate everything in one channel and uh, just raise your anonymous questions there. Um, and for those that uh, submitted questions in advance, which were not many really, uh, those would be also prioritized. So that's, uh, those will be the rules that we will follow for our questions and answers. Um, next slide, please. So on the agenda, we have the presentation that is um, organized in two blocks. First, we're going to be explaining about the what is the FSC policy for association remediation framework. So what, what is it, this framework, the objectives, the scope of that, and, and what are the process for the development of this framework and the engagement opportunities uh, that's going to be presented by Salem. And then we will have a break there uh, where we'll be, we will allow for questions that are related to that content block. And then we will move to more the specifics of the framework and Anna will present on the requirements of the framework and really what is the main content that is being proposed in this uh, draft. And then we will have an, another pause for questions related to that second block of the presentation. And uh, after that, we're going to be briefly explaining what are the next steps in terms of uh, stakeholder engagement activities that we will have uh, and remind you of the timeline so that you really have it fresh in your mind on when you can contribute with input. And uh, we will have yet another space, a much longer space of uh, questions and answers where you can really raise other questions uh, that have not been addressed throughout the presentation. Um, in total, we have logged two hours for this, so we really want to provide a very good space for you to ask questions and provide comments. And we hope that you really will participate and be active throughout the webinar. And uh, just before we get started with the presentation, just one uh, small but important comment, which is that uh, we will be focusing today on talking about the framework in itself. So um, we will not be, in principle, addressing questions about case-specific uh, about company specific questions. We really want to like keep it on a global level and really talk about this uh, standardized framework that we're developing. So with that, um, I think we can move to the next slide. Um, and I will hand over to Salem Jones, uh, Program Manager for Dispute Resolution and FSC International, who's going to be providing us the first part of the presentation. Thank you very much, Amparo, for that introduction. Um, we are um, we're very excited to be presenting to you today um, the first informational webinar in a series of webinars on the Policy for Association Remediation Framework. 
um, this piece of work um, is something that we have been working on uh, together at FSE International um, for the last four years. And this is a big opportunity um, and a, a momentous occasion for us to be sharing this work in this public consultation. Um, I am uh, the program manager, as, um, as Amparo mentioned, the program manager for the dispute resolution program at FSE International. I um, work together with Amparo uh, coordinating policy for association complaints, as well as ending disassociation processes. Next slide, please. I would like to provide um, you with an overview of what the policy for association remedi remediation framework is, and also to say a few words about what this remediation framework is not. The remediation framework um, is, a, is a composition, is a work formerly known as the generic roadmap. This remediation framework covers um, the requirements, thresholds, timelines, and guidance set by FSC, um, which is uh, intended to address and remedy policy for association violations. The PFA remediation framework is based on um, universal requirements, as well as a modular approach. It's designed um, to be flexible to deal with um, all policy for association violations in principle. And I'll get to that point later. The policy for uh, association remediation framework is not a, an organization specific roadmap, meaning that the policy for association remediation framework is not intended to be picked up and applied by any organization seeking to um, seeking to remedy any particular issue um, that they might have in order to end a disassociation with FSC or to resolve a policy for association violation in a pre-certification or pre-association -pre scenario. That process to design and draft and publicly consult an organization-specific roadmap is based on this uh, remediation framework, but is actually a different process. And we'll get to that later in this presentation. Um, the, the final um, policy for association remediation framework is scheduled to be um, presented to the FSC International Board of Directors in June 2022. This is the first of two planned public consultations on this work. Next slide, please. You might be wondering where this, this um, needs assessment or where the, um, where the idea of a remediation framework um, came and, and how it is that we, um, that we created this particular framework um, with this particular scope. And um, the FSC International Board has been formative in laying out high level objectives, um, high level guidance for the development of this work. Um, the International Board um, has laid out that this work, um, the remedy process should be based on consistent requirements not on arbitrary conditions and thresholds, but they should be applicable to all cases um, seeking to remedy PFA violations. That the conditions themselves should follow clear and predictable rules, that um, the conditions should be transparent for organizations seeking to remedy policy for association issues that um, the outcomes must lead to a changed management approach, which are demonstrable and measurable. And that the remedy process should, um, should contain both aspects of social and environmental um, remediation. And that, um, and that the, the process should involve um, should involve stakeholders and rights holders in the discussion around remedy and that this should be transparent and participation 
should be clear. An overall outcome or objective of the remedy framework should be the prevention of reoccurrence of policy for association violations in the future, which means that the transformations of the organization should be sustainable and lasting. And finally, that the verification of the milestones or the progress in the remediation process um, should follow a third party verification as, um, as does the FSC certification. Next slide, please. Further to the overall objectives of the remediation framework, this is very much connected to the policy for association and the scope of the policy for association. The remediation framework seeks to define in its process um, a remedi remedy for um, all six unacceptable activities as articulated in the policy for association. That being said, FSC has never had a policy for association complaint on the issue of GMO and forestry operations. Because of this, um, we have not independently developed requirements and indicators to address or remedy use of GMO and forestry operations. This is an area in the remediation framework that you will see a placeholder for, and this is subject to further learning, further discussion through, um, through the forest dialogues. The objectives um, of the remediation framework are to address the policy for association violations and, and to remedy the harm deriving from those violations. In addition, to rebuild trust with stakeholders, rights holders, and also within the market. We do this through the transformation of systems, um, quality management systems, the implementation of FPIC, uh, free prior informed consent throughout the operations um, and through other marked um, uh, infrastructure pieces to uh, create trust and to prevent the reoccurrence of policy for association violations in the future. Um, another important uh, tenant um, in the objectives of the remediation framework is to establish um, uh, establish access to remedy as, um, as defined in the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, and to also uh, develop and define a clear process for obtaining remedy agreements uh, with affected rights holders. And finally, um, to ensure the restoration and conservation of forest environmental values that have been damaged or harmed through policy for association activities. I would now like to explain to you the connection of the remediation framework through the global strategic plan. Next slide, please. As many of you will know, the global strategic plan has articulated um, uh, its, its vision for resilient forests to sustain life on earth. In addition to uh, resilient forests, we've also added um, resilient communities um, that rely on those forests to sustain life. And um, this, is a, this is where we create um, or we co-create um, processes through, um, through engagement with stakeholders, rights holders. Um, we engage uh, in peer review processes, as well as um, as well as uh, the involvement of experts and company representatives um, in the governance of the remediation framework. Next slide, please. In addition um, to the governance bodies um, within the remediation framework. We also um, see co-creation through the establishment of remedy agreements with communities, which are mutually agreed. We engage in principles of restorative practice, which again involve 
um, all of the intersecting interests um, within the harm within the harm scenario. Through the transformation of markets, which is another um, another strategic goal for the global strategic plan. Um, the remediation framework has the objective of building trust in the market through transparency and demonstration of progress, um, which is uh, expected to be reported and by, ver to be verified and reported on the FSC uh, demonstration of progress website. And to ultimately increase um, the eligible certified area in uh, key forest areas. And finally, through the um, catalyzing change, the remediation framework seeks to focus the transformation of organizations to prevent unacceptable activities moving into the future, to become resilient, and to create resilient communities, to transform the quality management systems, and to operationalize important, um, important aspects of the FSC normative framework. For example, free prior informed consent, in engagement of rights holders and stakeholders, the establishment of grievance mechanisms to manage conflict and, and access to remedy, and to ensure um, credible verification and reporting of progress. Um, next slide, please. This is um, the remediation framework is of course, does not exist in a vacuum. Um, it's very much connected to the policy for association, as well as to uh, the policy on conversion or um, um, and and to the conversion remedy procedure. Um, all four of these documents uh, converge around the concept of conversion. As you know, the policy for association articulates um, an unacceptable activity as um, significant conversion, which overlaps with the concept um, found in the policy on conversion as well as the conversion remedy procedure. And as the parent, uh, so to speak, the policy for association, which articulates all of these unacceptable activities, articulates the framework uh, in which this remediation, um, the policy for association remediation framework um, lives inside. FSC has intentionally um, has intentionally opened up uh, consultation on three of these um, of these intersecting documents, so that members and stakeholders have a good overview of the concepts and the direction that FSC is proposing um, in in these um, in in this new this new policy work. Next slide, please. Um, so the three public consultations which are currently ongoing are the conversion remedy procedure, the FSC policy for association, and this public consultation, the PFA remediation framework. The policy for association, the parent policy to the remediation framework uh, is open until the 17th of July. So we welcome your um, we welcome your comments to that policy um, very soon. The um, PFA remediation framework will be open, public consultation will be open until the 21st of August. So you have a bit of time um, to participate in further webinars, which we're scheduling, um, the next of which is this Friday at 12 o'clock um, CST time zone. We hope that you're able to participate. We welcome your feedback. Uh, we welcome um, we welcome a learning from you, and um, and we of course welcome your participation in the webinars. Next slide, please. I've provided you an overview of where the PFA remediation framework fits into the policy for association, as well as its connectedness to the policy and conversion. Um, I've also provided you a very short overview of where the, the PFA remediation framework fits into the um, 
strategic importance of the, of the global strategic plan. I would now like to bring you to an overview of the remediation framework um, as a document. Um, the, in this diagram, um, you will see that the remediation framework is organized into five main parts. There is a prerequisite um, and a drafting stakeholder consultation phase. There's then an implementation phase, a, um, a phase of, of restoration and remedy, then a verification, a final verification for ending disassociation, and then moving to the completion of the, um, of the roadmap itself. This is a high level over, overview, a landscape overview of the concept of the policy for association remediation framework in a linear, um, laid out um, in a linear way. The stars that you see represent FSC decisions, which are taken at key points in the implementation of the remediation framework. These stars represent very serious and intentional milestones in the progression of the framework. Um, the prerequisites and the, um, and the drafting of a company specific roadmap um, uh, ultimately um, result in a public consultation of the content of a, of a uh, organization specific roadmap, which is then finalized and brought to the FSC International Board of Direction, uh, Board of Directors uh, for approval. This decision um, must take place before a roadmap can actually start an implementation process. Only at this point will a company be able to apply um, the the roadmap to its operations and to actually um, start implementing the milestones. It's also the case that only at that stage would verification of those milestones begin. Um, the, one, the one last piece I would like to explain in this slide um, is that um, as you will see in, in number four, the verification for ending disassociation, um, the roadmap continues, the arrow continues past the ending disassociation mark, meaning that completion of the roadmap is not, is not final. The, the further completion of the roadmap would continue in parallel to an opportunity for the organization to re-engage um, in a certification process or reassociate with FSC. I would next slide, please. I would like to spend um, a moment in describing the application of the PFA remediation framework in a pre-association or pre-certification scenario and in an ending disassociation scenario. You will find the remediation framework lays out. Um, the scope of the remediation that needs to be performed in a pre-association, pre-certification scope as that of the company group as defined by the policy for association. And for an ending disassociation scenario, um, the remediation framework calls for um, remedy to be applied to not only the company group, but also to its wood and wood suppliers. This difference um, comes, from the, um, comes from the fact that an organization in a pre-certification or pre-association um, scenario has never been associated with FSC. FSC is um, um, in an ending disassociation scenario has um, conducted an investigation on PFA violations um, that have not been previously disclosed. The company um, 
the organization has been um, associated with FSC and there has been some level of trust that has been breached between FSC and the organization, which has led to ultimately a disassociation. Um, and for this reason, uh, in an ending disassociation scenario, the remedy applies to um, the wood and wood fiber supply chain as well. Next slide, please. The policy for association and the policy on conversion are the two high level documents which articulate the uh, remedy process for one for remedying a legacy of conversion and the other for remedying policy for association violations. Um, what I would like to explain here is at what point in time which policies apply to which, uh, to which uh, status, of, status of association. In pre-association, pre-certification, the FSC normative framework applies, meaning the policy for association, the policy on conversion, and the two uh, remedy procedures, respectively, depending on which level of um, of unacceptable activity has occurred. During association, both the policy for association and policy and conversion continue to apply to the certification process or to the association. And um, in an ending disassociation process, the policy for association remediation framework applies to remedy um, policy for association violations. And in the case of conversion, um, uh, one of the one of the uh, pieces that we would like to clarify in public consultation is where and at what point the conversion remedy procedure would apply to ending disassociation cases. Next slide, please. In um, in laying out the key areas of the remediation framework. Um, we have, um, we have brought in principles of continuous learning and co-creation as main tenants um, of the remediation framework process. Um, later in the presentation, you will see that we do this um, through iterations and um, through uh, continuous uh, building on learnings that we have um, in the implementation of the remedy processes. Um, we also um, have emphasized the importance of reporting on um, demonstration of progress and ensuring that reporting um, is done in a credible manner and, uh, and that this is, um, this is emphasized and articulated and, um, and, and repeated throughout the remediation framework um, to highlight the importance of, of transparency in uh, the progression of the remediation process. You will also find that uh, methodologies are peer reviewed and that peer review bodies are set up to review methodologies, provide feedback, and to ensure that best science and best practice are emphasized uh, throughout the development of methodologies. Um, furthermore, uh, we have um, paid close attention to the creation of strong and meaningful engagement with rights holders and stakeholders in the requirements and indicators level of the framework. Um, you will find um, also an emphasis on restorative practice and principles of restorative justice, and that um, the intention of the requirements and indicators is to provide outcome-oriented um, solutions for driving remedy, but not a prescriptive how-to manual on how organizations should apply those indicators, uh, those requirements and indicators within their operations. Next slide, please. Um, I would like to provide you a, a very simple overview of the, the process and timelines. We will, we will return to this at the end of the presentation. 
But for your information, we um, are currently in the consultation period for the remediation framework. This will go until the 21st of August. Um, we will then move into a um, consolidation of stakeholder feedback. We will also be connecting with the conversion remedy procedure, stakeholder uh, feedback in order to connect the dots between those two remedy processes to align and to, um, and to learn from the, both of these public consultations. We will then move into a drafting and a revision process. We will present um, our work thus far to the Interna FSC International Board of Directors in November of this year to provide an update on the outcomes of public consultation and where we've gotten to in terms of revision of the remediation framework. We will then move to a second public consultation in January of 2022 and uh, should come to a uh, final draft after reviewing stakeholder feedback uh, in April, May of 2022. And we would then be, pres we plan to present a final draft of the remediation framework to the FSC International Board in June of 2022. Um, next slide, please. And this brings me to, um, to your role in public consultation and to our, um, our appeal to stakeholders and our members to participate in public consultation, to provide us your feedback. Um, we have organized public consultation for the remediation framework into uh, two, different, two different levels. We've provided um, a high level summary document of only the requirements for those stakeholders that would like to get familiar with the high level direction that the remediation framework is moving. And we've developed some high level questions that we would like you to answer. In addition to that, we've also provided um, the full corpus of documents, including the requirements, indicators and guidance for the remediation framework, as well as some, some detailed questions regarding um, that, that deep dive level of, um, of uh, interest or expert level interest in the, in the details of the remediation framework. And, um, and for those of you that would like to get involved um, in a deep dive in certain sections of the remediation framework, this is also possible. You can just concentrate on certain sections, for exa example, environmental remedy or social remedy. Um, and provide feedback at that at that deep level, and then return to the high level questions. So we've we've tried to meet um, a diverse set of, of stakeholder um, needs in terms of uh, of um, addressing expert level um, issues as well as high level, um, just wanting to provide general direction feedback on on the way this this um, policy is move, excuse me the way this framework is moving. Um, we will be holding uh, a tech, two technical webinars th that are scheduled. It's possible that we would schedule additional technical webinars. And it sounds like um, from this morning session that we will also be putting together a podcast on uh, some of these deep dive issues as well. The next uh, technical webinar is scheduled for this Friday, the 2nd of July at 12 o'clock. That will be two and a half, uh, sorry, 12 o'clock CEST. Um, that will be a two and a half hour session. We've also planned uh, another technical web webinar for the 22nd of July um, for another two and a half hour session. Um, just for clarity, the topics that will be discussed in those two different two technical webinars are likely to be different. Um, we are going to develop the content based on stakeholder feedback from these informational webinars and also from uh, from uh, the questions that we've received from stakeholders in advance. So I think um, that covers the stakeholder engagement opportunities and the general overview. I would like to hand back to Amparo for questions. Thank you, Salem, for this very good um, presentation on the, uh, the overview of the framework. Um, we have two uh, people that have engaged in the chat box. Um, the first 
being Heiko, uh, making a really good question um, that I think many people in the audience are asking themselves. And he's asking, why are there four uh, procedures um, that have some level of overlap and why, why are they not combined in one holistic uh, policy or procedure that would make it less uh, complicated? Um, perhaps Salem, uh, you could speak to that point. Hi, Heiko, that's a great question. And, um, and I can say that, you know, the, the genesis of this work um, really started with the, um, with the motion seven, um, well, with motion seven, the approval of motion seven, um, the motion seven uh, working group, which then developed the first uh, draft of a of a conversion policy that was then um, revived into the motion 12 working group that um, that has now um, articulated this latest policy on conversion and um, and I think it's really that the story the story started from the motion rather than the story starting from higher up and looking at the lands, looking at the landscape of FSC policy and remedy from a holistic approach. Um, there was there's a kind of historical um, historical aspect to the creation of um, of or to the to the introduction of the idea of remedy um, within within the FSC framework. And um, and the the starting of this story, I think, with with motions has started a ball rolling, and that's um, that's resulted in the prolifer pr proliferation of of these these four policies. Thank you for that uh, response, Salem. Um, the next question we have in the chat box comes from Alan Smith. Uh, he actually is asking four different questions in, from very different nature. Uh, but the, the first one, very interesting for all of us, I believe, is uh, how is the procedure financed? So basically, how is this paid for? If you can respond to that. Yeah, um, so this, um, thanks for your question, Alan. This, um, this work would be, um, would be paid for by the organization which is implementing their company-specific roadmap, um, and um, and that would be um, that would be up to the organization to um, adequately fund and um, and provide the supporting um, supporting processes and structures in order to implement and run the remedy process. In terms of the infrastructure that would be required at FSC to um, to support this work, um, this is an, uh, a subject of ongoing discussions within FSC International. Um, but certainly, the um, the third party verification, setting up the third party verification, uh, would have some cost, as well as the operation of the um, what we call the um, demonstration of progress website. Um, these um, these are probably um, smaller costs, but still something that um, that we um, would need to look at within FSC International, how we would continue to support this work. Thanks, Salem. Um, question two from Alan. Uh, we're not going to be answering right now because uh, um, Anna Jenkins is going to be speaking to that point later in the presentation. So we believe that's going to be covered there. And if that's not the case, then we will get back to you uh, on the point on the due diligence. We have another question from him that it says, is there a cutoff point if the conditions for reassociation are not complied with? Five years is a review point, but some cases can go on seemingly forever. So he's asking here about the timeline of this process. And then he adds to that, um, if there's a probation mechanism or an alternative uh, as an alternative to disassociation. Um, I'll hand that over to you, Salem, if you can respond. Sure. Um, regarding the timeline, um, just to be clear, the, the five-year timeline is, it, that is correct, Alan, the idea is that there would be a five-year review if any disassociation had not been achieved within that time period. Um, but that, 
that timeline is um, is an example, um, is an estimation, um, and it could really depend on the complexity of, of the organization specific roadmap as to when that review period would be established. It could be five years, it could be seven years, depending on the complexity. Um, and again, that timeline is there not to put pressure on, um, on remedy agreements um, and not to put pressure on communities to come to resolutions on remedy agreements, but rather to um, continue, continue implementation um, to ensure that there's motivation and intention behind um, the progression of the milestones. So that's the intention there. Um, regarding the uh, a maximum timeline, um, we would um, um, we've not articulated a maximum timeline that um, that a company would have to fulfill the the uh, roadmap, their company specific roadmap in. Um, we have um, we've have said that we would review the um, the roadmap the the agreement between FSC and the organization implementing the roadmap on a biannual basis, meaning every two years, um, so that we have these check-in periods to make sure that things are running um, in an orderly orderly way and that and that milestones are being achieved and that there's good progress. But I agree that. Um, Sometimes um, these processes are quite complex, and it and it can take time. Thank you. Regarding pro oh, sorry. Oh no, sorry. I thought you had finished with that point. Um, I just wanted to mention regarding uh, probation. So I I believe Alan, you're you're referring to um, the um, uh, procedure zero one zero zero nine, um, the procedure on processing um, PFA complaints. There is, um, there are, are alternatives articulated in that procedure, um, which would allow for um, decisions to be taken outside of disassociation or no, or not disassociation. So that um, that flexibility or um, that space is available in that in that new procedure. It's just been published in January of this year. Thank you for that, Salem. Um, I saw Heiko Lideka had raised his hand earlier, um, and I wanted to give him the chance of if he wants to speak and uh, comment to uh, two additional questions that he raised in the chat box. Otherwise, I'll, I'll review those questions uh, and mention them for the group. Um, Heiko, would you like to um, speak to the group? Um, I'll take that as a no. Um, so we have two additional questions there. And he's mostly asking about the type of um, background study that FSC may or may ha not have done before initiating this revision process as to understand the needs for this, I suppose. That's what he means. Um, is that something that FSC has done or considered before initiating this, um, this framework, Salem? Um, thanks for that question, Heiko. Um, I, we have not conducted um, uh, a study on to assess the needs um, around the ending disassociation process um, that um, that has really arisen out of uh, a needs identified in the policy for association, as well as the previous procedure for uh, processing complaints. We did not have a mechanism um, for ending disassociation. This was um, it was developed on a case by case basis, and it tended to be um, it tended to be um, uh, non comparable um, across cases and um, and not leading to um, the same principles of equal treatment as that which um, which FSC would aim for in other in other areas of its operations. And for this reason, the needs basis really came out of uh, managing the policy for association and managing um, the procedure for processing policy for association cases. In terms of, um, in terms of the pre-association pre-certification opportunity for remedying policy for association violations um, outside of conversion, 
outside of conversion, um, remedying those policy for association violations um, is um, is something new. It's an added um, it's an added um, opportunity um, to the scope of this remediation framework, and um, and I guess that's that's a question that we could that we could in interrogate more further is um, what the needs basis for pre-association, pre-certification remedy would be um, outside, of a, outside of conversion, of course. Thank you, Salem. Uh, we're gonna give the, the floor uh, to Heiko. He still wants to comment a little more on this point. So we're just gonna give him that chance. Heiko, um, pl uh, please feel free to uh, speak your mind here and sh share your points. Thank you very much, Amparo. Um, good to see you all. Thank you very much for the presentation and everything. Um, I have one or had um, earlier one um, small point to my earlier question on why these different policies were not combined in a hierarchical framework. Um, I know the history of where this approach came from, but wouldn't it be um, or maybe just as a food for thought at the at the policy program in FSC International, wouldn't it be time to now recombine those things in more consistent, more hierarchical frameworks? We have a lot of elements in the, for example, in the remediation framework and the remediation procedure, which are common, like participation, engagement, transparency, peer review, all those things. Um, similarly, with the, with the policy approaches on policy on association and conversion and so on. So that's one thing. More food for thought than actually requiring a reaction. Um, but it would be easier for constituents to basically follow the approach if it was one succinct hierarchical framework, which then split up in different aspects of implementation. Um, the other question that I had on the, on the studies, um, having been involved in, in uh, um, some of the uh, different policy, as of, uh, policy for association cases, um, uh, I think that you know, one, one of the things that um, would have been quite important is that there is a, is a comprehensive evaluation of how these cases and where the sticking points were, how they were evaluated and all these things as a prerequisite for a review. And then furthermore, in some of these cases that I have been involved in, we took quite a careful look at other organizations and how they handled similar cases, especially in the very early days of the policy for association where we had no real concept in our mind. That was basically when the first case was APP um, on how this could be handled and how this could be integrated into the FSC frameworks. That was when the very first attempts were made to the to build a policy for association. So that's that's also more food for thought than, um, and I think that such review would make it easier for stakeholders to react with pointed questions or pointed input to um, the consultation if they saw the full, full picture, if they saw where have been the problems and the sticky points and everything in the um, in the current approach? Why are revisions necessary and where they come from? And also to see where other and how other organizations handle that. Last point, you pointed out that in the procedure for implementation, um, that there is um, more options. There was before only the option of either association or not as not a disassociation or not disassociation, and that there are now more options. Um, has this been constructed? I know, and I was involved in one case where the board, outside of policy and procedure, implemented one such option, which then led to a big, huge mess. 
and uh, the next board meeting after they had it decided that they withdrew that again and whatever in the meantime another complaint had been launched and so on and so on you know the case i'm not going to go into details i'm still under terms of confidentiality um, but have those things been very very thoroughly evaluated before building new options um, the one thing is that, you know, and I'm coming from a very particular point, I think a procedure like that needs to be based on factual decisions, not on political decisions. And we live in a political environment, left, right, front and center. Political decisions are always taken. And I think FSC would maneuver itself into a, an absolutely impossible situation if these everything related to this policy was not based on very clear fact, but based on political um, opportunity. Yeah. Um, I think maybe I could just respond sure. quickly to, to the last point. I mean, there's a lot of food for thought in there, Heiko. Um, and I can, um, I can maybe send you an email to to answer to some of the points, some of the food for thought that you um, that you've provided, because I think it's maybe um, you, you and I could have a telephone call to to address some of this food for thought and um, and play out um, some of these some of these ideas that you're that you're offering. Um, but just to the last point regarding um, kind of an, a, a holistic evaluation of the policy for association and um, and looking into the alternative to association and, and disassociation. Certainly through case management, we have done an internal evaluation of, um, of these controversial decisions. This was part of the um, policy for association um, materials that were prepared for the technical working group reviewing the policy for association and working on that, that document that's actually out for public consultation. So we, we have looked at other organizations and what they're doing um, to address controversial and unacceptable activities. Um, and those organizations are also looking at us and we've been in dialogue um, with, with organizations to also let them know what we're doing um, and how we're thinking about this. So this, this dialogue is, um, is taking place. It's rather informal. We don't have a formal platform for this. This is, um, probably something that, that could happen in the future um, that could be developed. But at the moment, it's, it's based on the goodwill of the organizations involved. But certainly, um, we are thinking along these, these lines and, um, and, and looking outside of FSC into, into the, um, the wider landscape to understand and to benchmark our own, our own thinking here. So, but thank you for those. Um, thank you for those, the, the food for thought, as you say, and happy to, to speak um, about that further. Thank you, Salem. Um, I just wanna make sure that we cover the most of the questions that we can and at the same time, we have enough time to cover the, the rest of the presentation because we still have a, quite a chunk of material to cover. Um, so the next uh, comment that we had is from Sera Noviani. Um, Sera, uh, we think your comment is going to be answered in the next part of the presentation that Anna is going to provide. So um, we're going to park it for now. And then if you still feel that your question is not answered, we'll come back to it and make sure that uh, it's clarified. Um, so we'll put that on hold. Then we have a hand raised from uh, Stuart Valentine. I'm going to give you the, fl the floor, Stuart, and uh, for you to share your point. Um, if we can keep it brief. Um, that would be good so that they, we can later move on to the rest of the presentation. Stuart? I'm not sure if this is Anna. I'm not sure if I got unmuted instead of Stuart. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's my bad, clearly. <laughs> I think we got him on the line now. Yeah, Stuart? thanks. I was, yeah. I was just typing a message to say I can't unmute. Um, I just wanted to comment on, on Heiko's point. I think Heiko raises a very good point. And if I look at the uh, look at this with hindsight, I agree 100% with Heiko that we, we should have looked at this 
in, in a far more holistic perspective, but we needed to do this six years ago when we started uh, uh, detailed work on the, the conversion issue and discussion, but that discussion has been around since FEC's inception as Salem pointed out. And I think it's a learning process for us that we now at a point where we realize that, that these uh, um, processes are very, very closely interlinked. But at the same time, my concern is if I look at the concerns of the membership, if we don't do something today and we wait until we align these processes 100%, we will be at this for another five years. And so fully acknowledging that what we're doing is putting in place an imperfect process for now, we put in place something that we can then refine and develop and improve on. And that's just my, my sort of take on, on what the FEC membership are looking for. Thanks. Thank you, Stuart. Okay, um, it looks like for now, uh, we've covered a whole set of questions, all of them triggering very interesting discussions here. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we can move on to the next part of the presentation, and then we will open the floor at the end of that second part of the presentation for further questions and comments. So over to you, Anna. Great, thanks very much, Amparo. Um, so I'm Anna Jenkins, I'm a forest consultant. Um, I've been working on this process um, under its name remediation framework um, this year, and then working on um, the, the predecessors to this process since 2017. And those predecessors were the draft APP roadmap, and um, then after the suspension of that process, then it's genesis into a generic roadmap and now genesis again into the PFA remediation framework. Um, I've been working this year with my colleague Shizuka Yasui based in Hong Kong um, and we've worked to to take a fresh look at the work that we did already and to present it in a different way. We hope this is more of a logical framework. Uh, we hope it's easier to use. Um, we hope we're combed out perhaps um, some of the case specific issues and made it more generic and more applicable globally in a general sense. And um, because the detail obviously will come with organization specific roadmaps and that this is the framework which holds those and guides them as to what they must contain. So um, next slide, please. So um, there are four documents in the consultation pack that you find on the um, consultation platform. There's a high level summary, which I would urge all stakeholders to read. Um, it contains a forward as well as an overview of the different sections within the remediation framework. Um, and that forward, that's the only place that, that forward is. And it captures the spirit and intention of, of this document. So then we have the main FSD remediation framework, and that's where all the detail is in terms of the um, requirements and the indicators. Then we have a guidance document. Um, it's cross-referenced with that main um, remediation framework document, so you can use them side by side. And then we have definitions in a, a fourth document, and those definitions are, are um, cross-checked cross with um, other parts of the FSC, like um, obviously um, the principles and criteria, the FSC's other definitions, glossary that captures definitions from all parts of FSC's normative frameworks, and indeed with the conversion um, policy and the conversion remedy procedure. Um, so that's still a work in progress, but our intention is obviously to um, align definitions absolutely across the FSC um, normative family. Um, next um, slide, please. So this is an overview of what we call the restorative continuum, and this is for the process of remedy of harm. This is whether or not it's social or environmental. So these are the, the general principles and steps that need to be applied at each stage. Um, so we start actually um, at the pre-roadmap stage, um, the pre-remediation framework stage. 
So when we say roadmap here, we mean, mean an organization specific roadmap as um, defined in 01009, which um, defines how we process complaints of the PFA. So at that pre-roadmap stage, there needs to be acknowledgement of harm done uh, by the company. So they cannot enter a roadmap process until there is acceptance that there has been harm done and acceptance of the willingness to remedy that harm. Uh, and no matter the nature of that harm. And at this stage also, we may not see the complete picture of harm, of course, but acknowledgement uh, at the very least of the harm that has brought the parties um, to FSC um, under a complaints procedure. So um, the, the uh, next full step, stepping into the roadmap. So this is once a roadmap has been established, and um, once we're inside the remediation framework structure, then the first step is to establish foundational infrastructure and systems. So what we would usually find is when there's been a failure, where there has been um, a PFA, Policy for Association violation, it's very often due to a lack of that base level foundation infrastructure and systems. This is where the due diligence systems lie, for example. And this is all in what we call section U, which U means universal. The next step would be identification of the rights holders, stakeholders, the rights and the harm. Um, so rights holders being a subset of stakeholders, uh, their, their rights being critically important, and what harm has actually taken place. There's several ways that we can identify harm, and I'll be talking about some of those in future slides. So once we have that identification done, then we can step into the dialogue process, because we know who our rights holders and stakeholders are. We can gather them together, and then we the first thing we need to do is say, OK, what will be the process that we will enter into? Because the very first thing is to agree the process and make remedy process agreements. Um, generally, uh, quite rightly, stakeholders, rights holders have quite strong opinions about, you know, how can we conduct this process of dialogue? There are many different approaches. There may be traditional approaches for some cultures. And those traditional approaches really should be given um, you know, foremost consideration. Um, so having a discussion about having a discussion, we will come up with um, the parties involved rather will come up with remedy process agreements. Once they're agreed on the way that they will go forward with their process, they can make that agreement and then they, they're ready to start the remedy process discussions, the dialogue in earnest. So then we get to the stage where we hope we're having these discussions. We hope we get to an agreement stage. The dialogue is ongoing. And then we reach the stage where we have remedy of harm agreements. So the harm has been acknowledged. It's known. There's been a good process of dialogue. The stakeholders, rights holders are happy with that dialogue and hopefully they reach an agreement with the company or organization in question and say, okay, now we know what we need to do. At the identification process, also pilots will have been chosen. So these may be cases, these may be some of the most urgent cases. They may be um, some of the most egregious cases. They, may, they really should be cases of different types and sizes. So it could be a very large case. It could involve just one person or a single household, but to have a range of cases so that those can be piloted, you'd be used as pilots to then test these remedy process agreements and test um, and make sure that a remedy of harm agreement can be come to. Um, there will be priority activities identified and these activities, priority activities in the remediation action stage, the remedy stage, these priority activities will have to be put into place. They will have to be um, delivered in a way that all parties are satisfied with progress. So particularly stakeholders, rights holders will need to be happy with how's this going? How are we doing? Are we making good progress between 
uh, sorry, towards these process agreements, then the remedy of harm agreements, and then do we have actual priority um, activities delivered on the ground? So the number of pilot cases will vary from case to case. This will be for the uh, roadmap process to decide ahead of the roadmap being implemented. And once we know that we've got those cases um, in place, we've got the priority activities met, then this is what would trigger, okay, now we are ready to end disassociation once we've got to that stage. There will also be other milestones that have to be met along the way, and I'll be mentioning some of those in the coming slides. Now, after we get to that point of hopefully ending disassociation, the roadmap doesn't end there. We enter into a resilience stage, and you'll be able to see this from a different angle on the a coming up slide. Then we're going to have to have ongoing remedy implementation. There's going to have to be ongoing communication and relationship building, trust building, coming from the fact that these remedy of harm agreements are being properly implemented and activities are being um, implemented on the ground and that we do have outcomes coming forward, delivered as, as wanted by these all parties involved around the table. So next slide, please. This is an overview of the different sections in the remediation framework. The orange sections on the left, um, which I'll go through in more detail in coming slides, we have section U, the universal requirements. These are the foundational infrastructure principles and procedures. We have section T, T for trust building measures. So this covers things, um, additional things like anti-corruption measures. Then we have section R, which is um, the section on remedy of harm procedure and identification of harm. Then um, that section R at the bottom of the orange section that, inter, um, that interrelates with two more detailed sections. We have RE for remedy of harm for environmental issues. Oh goodness, sorry about that. I just stopped my telephone. Um, we have section RE that's for environmental issues and we have section RS which is remedy of harm for social issues. Now the RE is more detailed than the RS section and we'll come to that. Then in the top right hand corner, you can see um, a gray area of boxes. So these are PFA elements, um, specific elements. So the policy for association elements, we have elements A to F covering all the different um, unacceptable activities that the PFA details. So within the remediation framework, we have a section for each of these, and this section will guide the reader, the user, to which sections of the remediation framework they need to apply. And it will also add if there are any additional, very specialist requirements for that situation, it will detail those and perhaps um, in the case, particularly for um, significant conversion, for example, there's quite a lot of clarification of um, which parts apply and also in relation to the um, conversion remedy procedure, because obviously there's an overlap here, which Salem covered. So we go into detail there of which, of which um, parts apply under which situation. I'm not going to go into great detail about these, um, these sections A to F in this um, webinar, but if you want to know more about that, then please come to the technical webinars and we can get into more detail there. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's that other view. So here we can see um, the, the rough starting point and the flow through um, of each section in the remediation framework. So on the left, we've got a light green strip, and that shows the start of the organization specific um, roadmap. On the right, we have a sort of darker, more lime green color strip, and that marks the end of um, disassociation. Um, obviously, if all the, all the um, necessarily mi uh, milestones and pilot um, delivery of priority activities, etc. As long as those are met, 
then there would be an ending of disassociation at those points. And what we can see here is some sections start sooner than others. Section U will need to start first of all to get those foundations in place. And then the, probably the last one to start will be the remedy um, of harm process, because we need to get a lot in place before we start that. But all these sections, they all run through and they all go past the ending of disassociation point. So this is meaning that it doesn't just all stop once disassociation has ended. Ending disassociation and um, if the company does get FSC certified in any way, whichever certification they choose, then that continued certification is dependent upon the um, remediation framework, the company specific roadmap has to still be kept up with and completed. So there's an overlap. Next slide, please. So in this slide, what we wanted to illustrate to you is that it's quite an iterative process. So while it is step by step in a linear fashion, we have to check back. So as we get into the detail, as we identify rights holders and stakeholders, as we identify harm, we find that, okay, maybe the picture is fuller than we imagined. Maybe there are more people involved than was originally imagined. Perhaps the harm is more extensive than originally imagined. So we may even get into the remedy of harm process and the pilot cases and find out more and more as we progress. So we will have to track back if we identify more stakeholders, more rights holders, then we track back. If more harm is identified, then that's tracked back and added to the registry of harm. So it is linear, but it's also iterative. So there's a continuous improvement feedback. We improve processes as we learn from pilot cases and we track back and check, okay, have we got the right people involved here? Are we seeing a complete picture? As we get more um, information, perhaps from independent experts involved, then again, we track back and um, it's an iterative process. We've given a, a, a great simplification of the, um, um, the conversion remedy procedure at the bottom, just to touch in so that you can see that the different names of the different stages of the conversion remedy procedure. But um, you know, this is very simplified, so this is not meant to be a replacement for reading the CRP. So next um, slide, please. Okay, let's take a look at some of these sections in a bit more detail. So there's the sections again. And I mentioned those gray sections, which I call section A to F. And those are the requirements and guidance sections specific to the PFA elements. We won't get into any more detail here um, after this slide, but just to mention again, come to the more detailed um, sessions, the technical sessions for that. So let's start with section U, the universal requirements. Next slide. Okay, so here's an overview. Um, these are some of the uh, ground issues that it will be covering. And we'll go to the next slide to get into some of that detail. Okay, so requirement 1.1, um, sufficient resources and applying continuous learning. So there needs to be sufficient resources to ensure that the company specific roadmap can be actually properly um, implemented and continuous learning needs to occur. So we put some of these um, very universal requirements in section U because otherwise we were re repeating ourselves constantly through, throughout the remediation framework saying, you know, make sure there's sufficient resources, make sure people are sufficiently trained, make sure that you learn from what's happening. So we put these here as a general principle that must be applied everywhere. The remediation governance body in 1.2, this is absolutely central. This governance body is semi-autonomous from the company. So it does have company representatives on it, but 70% of the representation at least needs to come from others. 
and those would be rights holders, stakeholders, independent experts would form that remediation governance body. And they have a lot of work to do to review and oversee all of the process that unfolds under the company support organization specific role. There must be a grievance mechanism. This is a central tenet of the UN guiding prism, uh, principles on business and human rights. Um, the grievance mechanism provides the way that harm as it occurs can be caught. Problems, conflicts, grievances can be um, heard properly and respectfully and then remedy applied as an automatic part of the company's systems um, to ensure that the company um, is making amends routinely, but is also learning as well. And again, this requires um, an independent governance body, again, as specified by the UN guiding principles. That might be the remediation governance body, um, but that would be for those involved to decide. That would be one option, for example. Um, we need to have systems in place to stop and prevent unacceptable activities. When we say unacceptable activities, we mean no violations for the policy for of the policy for association. So those are the policy elements A to F. So we need systems in place to stop those unacceptable activities happening, which clearly will have happened for there to be a remediation, um, a need for the remediation framework and a company specific roadmap. Um, we need to identify and respect rights and rights holders. This goes without saying almost, but it needs to be clearly stated here. And we need to apply the practice of ethic, free prior informed consent in interaction with those rights holders. Next slide, please. So we also need to identify and engage wider stakeholders. Rights holders are just one group of very central stakeholders, but there are wider stakeholders as well who need to be included. We need to um, have to be reassured and see that there are human, right, human rights due diligence um, systems in place, a framework and environmental due diligence framework as well. So this, these are um, impact assessments and um, risk assessments first off, and then actual impact assessments. The findings from these processes will again feed into the registry of harm. So if harm is found, then it needs to be registered. And that registry of harm is then reviewed um, a bit later on, and I'll talk about that soon. Lastly, but definitely not least, we need to establish systems and platforms for transparency and demonstration of progress. Broadly speaking, this is done in two ways. The company can have its own website and it can report um, on its website. And it will also need to um, send through to FSCs, um, to, the, to the FSC independent verification body. It will need to send through very specific pieces of information which are stated in the remediation framework and then will be in the company specific roadmap. We'll have to send through specific things which will be published on FSC's behalf. So they will be verified by the FSC independent verification body, and then they will be published. And that um, progress website, the remediation progress um, website, that is the um, defining place where um, progress of company through the roadmap, that's where that's stated. How far have they got? And that would be the place where any stakeholders or um, anyone interested in that company's progress, that's where they could see the verified progress. Next slide, please. These are the trust building measures. Um, it's a shorter section. So these are additional measures and it includes the application of the controlled good standards and anti-corruption measures and making sure that all taxes, fines, fees and penalties are paid. Next slide, please. So here's where we find, um, find them in the different requirements sections. So um, the most detailed section here is the application of FSC controlled wood. Um, let's go to the next slide and have a look at the detail of that. 
So the first thing to say about this is when we say application of the FSC controlled standards, uh, controlled wood standards, we are not meaning that the disassociated company can get controlled wood certified. It can't because it's disassociated from FSC. But what we're doing here is we are checking compliance with the controlled wood standards using the um, FSC verifier, independent verifier, but no claims will be able to make, be made, no labeling, no business to business communication. This is just about getting systems in place to reduce risk. If a disassociated um, company wanted to make controlled wood claims, they would first have to end disassociation and then go through a full controlled wood process. Of course, if they've done a roadmap well, then they'll be really ready to do that, but they can't make claims until they go through that um, formal process. So to explain what happens pre-disassociation, um, the ending of disassociation, and then in the, um, the steps afterwards, um, what we will need to see is in all the company group facilities, there's a yellowy colored arrow at the bottom, and that represents the FSC standard 40.005. So that standard would have to be applied to all facilities. And that means the company would have the systems and procedures to separate controlled wood from uncontrolled material. Doesn't mean everything's controlled yet, but it means they can segregate. Then there would be um, the identification of first priority suppliers, second priority suppliers, that's the middle arrow, and then all other suppliers, so the lesser priority. The first priority are likely to be the most risky. Now we need to see a good proportion of these, um, most of them in fact, being, um, going, being compliant with control wood 30010, so that's the forest management control wood standard. They would need to be compliant prior to the ending of disassociation. The gray area you see on this um, graphic is the growing area of proportion of actual controlled wood in the system. So after ending disassociation, then there needs to be the focus on getting the second priority suppliers up to speed and having, making sure that they are all control wood compliant. Then finally, all other suppliers, so that once we reach the second milestone, which could be, um, it's, you know, we're calling it A years and B years at the moment, because that will change case to case. This will be for the stakeholders and those involved in setting the company specific roadmap would need to decide what is A years, what is B years. But once we get to that second milestone, we need to see all supply is controlled with. So next slide. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to mention that in terms of um, uh, uh, Section T, could you just go back a couple of slides, Alex? Thanks. Yeah, in the anti-corruption measures, we ask a specific question in the stakeholder questions about perhaps widening these anti-corruption measures. And again, this is based on other systems and particularly um, taking some learning from the mining sector. So take a look at that question if this um, interests you specifically. So yeah, two, two slides on please, Alex. Okay, so this is section R, the remedy of harm procedures. So this is um, where we identify and prioritize environmental and social harm. Now we will already have some harm cases in the registry of harm pot. We will know from the grievance procedure and we will know from due diligence procedures. Um, but we need to do an extra step here. We, we also cover remedy of harm um, procedures in detail, um, including the dialogue and pilot cases. Next slide, please. So these are the titles. Requirement 3.1 and 3.2. This is a revisitation, part of this iterative approach. Have we got the right rights holders um, here? Do we have the right stakeholders here? Are we engaging? So then we have mapping of environmental and social harm. So first we have to dis, um, agree the methodologies and then we have to map and actually agree the maps. 
So these will be peer reviewed. The governance body will be looking at these. And when we've identified harm in this third way, then that goes to the registry of harm. And that requirement, uh, the indicator for the registry of harm is inside 3.3. So then we have um, procedures to remedy of harm. Now this describes not the exact way that everybody must do it, because that's gonna change in culture to culture, situation to situation. But what it does describe is the ingredients for an, um, a, a process that goes well. So there will need to be good information. There will be, need to be good empowerment and systems to adjust for power differences. There will need to be the right place and we're using the right process I've mentioned already about um, traditional processes in certain areas. Now those need to be given very high respect and very high priority. Would these be the right way for the conversation to happen, for dialogue to happen? That takes us to those remedy process agreements I spoke about before. In this, um, in this section, we identify those pilot cases. Um, some of those will come from the prioritization of harm, which happens in 3.3. And the pilot cases um, need to be chosen at this point because that's what's going to go forward into the actual doing um, prior to ending disassociation. So next slide, please. Um, remedy of social harm. This is a relatively simple section actually because most of what's needed here has already been stated in section R, um, R in particular, and underpinned by section um, U. So this is kind of like a reminder section. And again, like all section, transparency and progress needs to be reported on. Next section. So the remedy of environmental harm is a little bit more complex. Um, we have more requirements here. And we have landscape level conservation and restoration plans. And then we have the implementation of pilot plans on site level. Next slide, please. So um, in these sections is where the detail is. We're not gonna get into great detail for these sections here in this webinar, but if you would like to really get into the, the detail of exactly what is in a landscape level conservation and restoration plan, then please come to the technical webinars. Um, I can give um, an overview of um, some principles here, just as an, um, to capture the main points. And so there are some main principles and those principles are the need for um, equivalence. So when a certain amount of area is lost, say a certain amount of HCV is lost, then we need to have um, a proportionate area will need to be conserved um, or restored as part of the remedy. We also have um, the equivalence um, principle. So that means if a certain HCV has been lost, we can't just replace it with any old thing. So we would need, um, so if it's a peatland area, it would need to be uh, remedied with an equivalent peatland area if the exact area cannot um, be uh, um, restored or conserved. Then we have the principle of proximate to the impact area. And then we have principles of additionality and longevity as well. So as I say, we can get into more detail there in the um, technical webinars, but that's just to give you the main principles now. So next slide, please. So we're ready for some questions on this. Um, if people have read documents already, then yes, we can go a little bit deeper here. Um, and that's fine to ask questions that you have. If they're very detailed, then we can direct you into the next um, technical webinars, but we'll do our best today. So thanks for listening and over back to you, Amparo. Thank you, Anna. Very good presentation. Um, we have a question from Hartono, which is a representative of FSC Indonesia for those that um, don't know here in the chat. And he's asking, how are we gonna define control wood equivalent or above? 
And then he's making the point of whether FSC is going to consider other schemes as control would equivalent or above, which I think is an interesting point. Okay, thanks, Hap. Um, we haven't considered anything about other schemes. I think this would be much more appropriate to be done at the point of defining an organization specific roadmap, because it would be for those in the region to understand clearly you know, what is the equivalence here. I think what's really important is that the FSC third party verification um, body, the, the, the verifier, they're going to be taking the FSC controlled with standards and they're going to be saying, okay, has this been met or not? Sometimes it's quite hard to speak about like mutual recognition of other schemes, but it may be through experience um, that it is learned that actually these really are equivalent. I'm not sure I, in my position, I'm in the place to predict that, but just to emphasize that it is the controlled word, um standards themselves that those verifiers will be taking into the field and checking. Thank you for that clarification, Anna. Um, we had parked, um, so I can see that Alan Smith has his hand raised, and before we had also uh, parked a uh, question regarding due diligence. I'm going to give you the floor, Alan, and um, you can share your thoughts now. I don't know if it's an additional question, and you can also let us know if um, yeah. we have clarified your point about the due diligence before. Okay, I'm, um, I'm quite happy with due diligence, and thank you very much, Anna, for the very a comprehensive explanation. Uh, what I, I do have is, is going to just one other point, which is about uh, transparency and demonstration of progress. Uh, I haven't seen anything about how this will be communicated more widely, more publicly. As you will be aware, in the international media this year and last year, uh, there was very negative publicity about one particular case. And I'm wondering if uh, this also is incorporated into the uh, procedure, that is uh, communicating beyond those directly affected. Thanks. Salem, did you want to speak to this? First of all, I'm just wondering, because I think it sort of crosses over. Obviously, Alan, we can't talk about specific cases here. Right. Um, but I mean, it's certainly the case that in our guidance, and then it, it becomes part of the contract, which I think this is the piece that Salem needs to speak about. But within the guidance, they cannot, uh, no one can overclaim progress. Um, you're talking specifically about negative publicity on specific cases. Um, obviously what we're focused on here is truth speaking about what's actually happened in, in terms of progress and veri verification of that. So that's just slightly different what the remediation framework contains to what you're asking. So, Salem, do you have anything to add on contracts and what maybe Alan I, is saying? Yeah, maybe I can approach this. Um, maybe Alan, it's it's help, helpful to to separate this into two different uh, communication pots, so to speak. We have the communication around demonstration of progress on the implementation of the company specific roadmap, and we also have FSC's communication that we make around. Um, dispute resolution cases, policy for association complaints, um, uh, updates uh, regarding investigation of policy for association complaints. And, um, and I think what, what you're pointing out is that there has been, um, there has been a stakeholder um, attention and stakeholder criticism around the way FSC is managing its communications around um, policy for association complaints and policy for association investigations, um, and as well as today, demonstration of progress of, of, um, of companies um, um, moving through the progression of the conditions that FSC has placed. In the future, what the PFA remediation framework calls for is 
a dedicated site, a dedicated website that um, would would actually publish the verified um, uh, verified reports um, regarding the implementation of company specific roadmaps. So we're actually proposing that this um, the way we go about communicating the progression of roadmaps and the ending disassociation um, processes would actually be kind of ramped up or made more visible through this demonstration of progress website. I hope that answers your question, Alan. Uh, yes, it, it does uh, to a large extent. And I'm very happy that this is taken on board. Uh, but my question was directed specifically at how does FSC intend to communicate uh, progress on the various cases that it, it may be dealing with? So I think what you are suggesting is a, a very positive move. So thank you for that. Thank you, Alan. Um, good to hear positive feedback, of course. Um, I just want to um, give a shout to Ser, uh, Sera Novia Eni. Um, you mentioned earlier that you had a question about pre-association and ending this association, which we were hoping to answer through the second half of the presentation. Um, so I believe we have explained. Okay, I can see your comment now. Yeah, we're going to go back to that uh, question and perhaps Salem um, can provide more input to that. So Sera's comment is, could you explain more about pre-association and ending disassociation in the context of PFA remediation framework, please? I don't know if with this question, it's enough basis for you to respond, Salem, or if we need further clarification from Sera, um, but she still seems to have questions around that. Hi, Sera. Yeah, I'm, I'm, happy to, um, I'm happy to explain this further. The... Um, the policy for association remediation framework covers or lays out a remedy process which covers the entire scope of association possibilities um, as articulated in the policy for association. What that means is that the remedy framework provides an opportunity for remedying policy for association issues prior to certification, prior to association with FSC. This very much fits the spirit of the conversion policy and the conversion remedy procedure to evaluate the legacy of conversion, to lay out a remediation process to address that legacy of conversion before joining the FSC family. In a similar way, the PFA remediation framework lays out a process, a scope to address policy for association violations prior to joining the FSC family, either through association or certification. The ending disassociation or maintaining association scope lays out the remediation, uh, uh, the re remedy process for addressing policy for association violations, which have are subject of the disassociation with FSC. So the remediation framework covers the entire scope or the entire spectrum from pre-association, pre-certification, all the way through to ending disassociation. Does that answer your, your question, Sarah? Hopefully um, those clarifications have covered that question. Otherwise, please uh, let us know and we will explain further. Thank you, Salem. Um, we got another comment from Chris just now. Um, Yeah, it's just a comment, nothing to really answer there. And then Seda is confirming that, yes, uh, her answer is a question has been answered there. Um, so I think we can move on to the last few slides uh, where we explain about the 
timelines and process, and then we can open up for the very final set of questions and answers. And in the meantime, I invite everybody in the audience to really uh, think if they have any questions or comments they would like to ask. I can see the, the chat is a little less active than before. Over to you, Salem. Thank you, Amparo. Um, again, I just wanted to highlight that um, uh, we've just started a public consultation for the PFA remediation framework. Um, today is the first day of webinars that we're hosting. We're planning two additional webinars, um, one on the 2nd of July and another on the 22nd of July. We're also open uh, to scheduling additional technical webinars on further subjects um, on a needs basis. We've also discussed uh, in the morning session that we will um, we'll put together a podcast to also um, take a deeper dive into some of the um, more interesting pieces of the remediation framework. So um, we're just starting consultation now, but there's lots of opportunity to provide your feedback and to engage in a discussion with FSC around some of the ideas in the remediation framework which we would, we would very much uh, welcome. Um, in addition to the webinars, there are also um, consultative forums um, that are taking place um, through membership forum. And uh, these are of course connected to larger conversations around conversion um, and, uh, and other topics, but of course also very relevant for the remediation framework. I also wanted to just um, emphasize one last time that the uh, public consultation for the policy for association revision is still open. You have a few more weeks to participate in that public consultation before it closes. It is the parent uh, policy to the remediation framework. So we would welcome you um, providing your feedback on the public consultation platform um, as soon as possible. Um, and the last, the last slide, I would like to just leave you with um, a few of our, our final take home messages. Essentially, that um, the, the policy for association remediation framework, um, we have, um, we've paid close attention to connecting this to the global strategic plan, um, to connecting this to um, the movements in the uh, conversion policy and the conversion remedy procedure to the developments um, uh, in the policy for association. And of course, the learnings from FSC uh, case management in processing and managing policy for association cases over the last um, now 13 years. So this is really, um, uh, this body of work um, has really culminated um, a lot of a lot of learning is connected to a lot of pieces um, that, or a lot of discussions um, that are ongoing at FSC, and um, there's a huge opportunity to um, to create uh, a really important um, and monumental piece of work here, and we're very excited about being part of it. So I would like to close uh, the, our presentation there, open up the floor um, back to you, Amparo, for uh, for questions. Um, we don't have any new questions in the chat box um, or hands raised in the in the participants list. So we'll keep an eye on that. If somebody has something else they would like to ask or comment, please do so. And we will start going through those questions in order. Um, in the meantime, um, Salem, perhaps you can answer uh, a question I have <laughs> that I've had for a while um, that I think maybe some people in the audience also have. Uh, which is about the timing for the publication. Um, and we know this has been, uh, the remediation framework has been developed uh, throughout a rather long uh, time frame. And um, yeah, the question is really, how come we're publishing this now and perhaps not before? Yeah, I think, um, I think that's a good, um, a good question. And I think it's, it's important to explain that, um, you know, it's true that um, this work has been ongoing for the last four years, um, that we have um, developed our thinking, developed this, um, this process really through um, a hands-on application of trying to develop an ending, 
ending disassociation procedure um, in multiple cases. Um, we have worked on um, the development of conditions for ending disassociation in many different cases, specifically um, the, the idea of developing a standardized framework came out of the experience um, working on the Asia Pulp and Paper Roadmap. Um, and this experience really showed us that we need to have a standardized approach in establishing conditions for ending disassociation in order to ensure equal treatment, in order to provide a normative framework, a normative backbone for supporting these cases and um, to give assurances to organizations engaging in these processes that the goalposts are not going to shift or not going to move. And that um, it's only through the creation of a codified um, process will we be able to provide those assurances and, um, and, and ensure equal treatment and, and comparable results over time. And so through the, um, the articulation of this need, um, we began the development of, at, at the time, what we called the generic roadmap, um, which was a process to further, um, um, further bring the roadmap that we were working on to a higher level, to a, a, a more applicable, um, to a scope more applicable to across commodities and across uh, forest areas. At the time, we thought maybe this would be limited to an application for a particular region. Um, and then um, in our further discussions, we said, actually, no, um, we need to have a framework which is applicable across all regions and then rely on company specific roadmaps to really dive in and address the company specific um, company specific implementation and um, and feasibility issues in individual organization specific roadmaps and that's that's kind of where we have um, where we have gotten to now with the PFA remediation framework and the draft that we've brought out to public consultation. The, um, over the course of the, um, the development of these concepts and of these drafts, we have gone through um, consultation with targeted stakeholders to further um, improve our thinking, um, widen, our, widen our scope, um, discuss different different forest landscapes and also different uh, different uh, forest commodities over time. So, but this is this is indeed the first time that we've we've engaged in public consultation on um, on this piece of work. Thank you for that clarification, Salem. I think it's a question that a lot of people were wondering about. We have a question in the chat box from Heiko Lideka, um, very good one actually, and he's questioning a little bit um, the fact, I guess, that this uh, draft remediation framework is, uh, as he says, rather descriptive in detail, uh, rather than focusing on a high level guiding principle or policy level. So why, why is the reason for this being so rule based, he's asking, and descriptive? Um, maybe I can I can answer to that, and um, and Anna, you could you could provide further comment. Um, the reason why um, we have we have chosen this um, this particular format um, is really um, is really through our experience in developing conditions for ending disassociation. We found that it's really um, it's really important for organizations as well as, as well as rights holders and stakeholders to have a clear, um, a clear concept of what the requirement is that they have, to, um, they have to reach. And the indicator level in describing um, what it is that has to be included in the verification of that requirement to show, yes, indeed, I have reached this. Um, that this, that this, uh, we, I don't know that I would call it rules-based approach. I would call it, um, um, I would certainly call it, um, I would agree that it's descriptive um, in its, um, in the indicator level in describing what needs to be attained to meet the requirement. Um, but that, um, 
but that this um, this language and, and and this format is there to build trust and to also provide clarity and assurance that um, the goalposts again are not being moved. I would say, um, in addition to that, before I open the floor up to Anna, um, that in applying, you know, in developing um, roadmaps over the last few years for other ending disassociation cases, um, it's also um, it's also important. We found it to be important that the um, that the requirement and the indicators are able to be um, are able to be verified. And um, we found that in framing the requirement in um, in what you describe as rules based language um, does make it more pro approachable and um, and more um, understandably verifiable um, than a process um, or, or policy based uh, language, which might be more open for interpretation. So, um, Anna, can I, would you like to comment on that further? Yeah, sure, Salem. Um, thanks for starting. Yeah, thanks for the question, Heike. Um, I think as with many things that there can be pulls in different directions. So much of the content of the indicators of the remediation framework, in fact, almost all of it has come from um, direct development with a stakeholder working group and with targeted consultation um, with a wider group It included that stakeholder working group, but a, a wider group of very involved individuals um, from all kinds of backgrounds, um, NGO, um, community and company backgrounds in the Southeast Asia region. So when we are working directly with those stakeholders, then there can often be quite a pull for real precision um, on this is exactly what this company needs to do. It needs to look exactly like this. Otherwise, we won't trust it. And indeed, um, to the extent that uh, our experience on some very detailed areas is um, stakeholders would really wanted everything in the normative area. So they wanted the, everything as indicators um, and not in guidance because it's not normative. Um, we even at one stage had a kind of medium a place called normative guidance, which we knew we couldn't keep forever, but we, we kept it as part of the discussion process to show what was actually super important to stakeholders. So one of the consequences of that is that um, you know, that kind of pull can lead to much more detailed what you would call rules based and perhaps what you're meaning there is it's not outcome orientated, it's more rules based. Um, we hope that we've got some balance in this document now. It may be that it's still a little bit top heavy on rules base, but if I, I've just got it up in front of me now and I just chose a section at random and where I am in, in, in this is in 3.3, .3, the identification of environmental and social harm. So for example, the first set of indicators there about methodologies for maps for developing uh, to deliver mapping and inventory of, of past um, and current status of all the impact areas. Um, and in this section, for example, we don't say what those methodologies should look like. We don't actually say anything about those methodologies at all. We just say, please state the methodologies. What we do say is these are the areas it's got to cover. So it must cover natural forests converted since 1994. It must, must cover HCB areas. It must cover illegal logging, including encroachment. So you'll hear that a lot of that is the sections of the PFA. I suppose we could have just said sections of the PFA, but we do also add some other things here, like high carbon stock approach, um, high carbon stock rather areas, because many of those will be mapped already in some parts um, of the world, particularly South, Southeast Asia, land cover and use, and then obviously crucially communities. 
So we do say what the maps should cover, but we don't say what the methodologies are in them. So that's kind of like a hybrid, I guess, sort of rules based and then a bit more principle top line. The crucial part here is that these methodologies are peer reviewed by independent experts and that they're reviewed by the remediation governance body and then also um, assessed by the FSC third party verifier within a certain time frame. So it's more the principle of do your methodologies work for those involved? Do independent experts agree that these will work? And has this been verified by FSC third party verifier? So a bit of a hybrid, but would really appreciate your detailed feedback because I know outcome orientation is a, a real passionate focus, focus of yours. So if you are able to give us detailed feedback in the consultation, then that is very, very um, much welcome. Thanks, Heike. Thank you, Anna, for that clarification. Um, I hope that um, address that comment, Heiko, otherwise uh, let us know. In the interest of time, we have three minutes left. Uh, we still have one more slide that we would like to share with you, um, kind of with the takeaway messages that we hope you take uh, home from today's uh, webinar. And we have a poll to really understand what's your level of information. So maybe Salem, you can run us through the conclusions. Yeah, certainly. Thanks, Amparo. Um, yeah, today's um, takeaway is that, um, you know, the, um, the intention of the PFA remediation framework is to really create an opportunity for um, remedying policy for association um, issues and to drive a process for social and environmental remedy. Um, this um, this current uh, public this current draft out for public consultation is a draft. It is the the first draft. It is a set of um, a set of ideas. Um, it it provides a direction, and certainly um, we are very open to receiving your feedback and to your inputs. Um, we will continue to make sure that webinars like this um, dialogue. Um, technical webinars and, um, and opportunities for feedback are made available. Um, if you have ideas for additional, um, additional webinars or podcasts, please send them through. Um, we're certainly open to this and would really like, um, would like your active participation in this public consultation. Thank you, Salem, um, for explaining these key messages that we hope people remember after ending this session. Alex, if we can launch that poll, um, if you everybody could stay just 30 seconds longer in the session and let us know uh, what your thoughts are so far, uh, we would like to understand um, the level of information and um, the main feelings from the audience. We will leave the poll open for a couple of minutes. In the meantime, um, I can see there's no further comments in the chat box, so um, we will probably close it from here. Um, I do want to say that uh, if somebody has questions afterwards, please feel free to reach out to us by email um, or any other means, and we're happy to answer questions afterwards. And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, this is going to be this has been recorded and it's going to be provided in our website as well, so you can also come back here and uh, watch it again. And um, also to mention that, as, as Salem said, we're going to have technical webinars, um, one of them this Friday and then another one on the 22nd of July. So feel, feel free to participate in those um, and take part of those more technical discussions. We have now 46% of the participants that have uh, filled the vote. So we're just going to give a few more seconds to hopefully get some more answers and a more representative uh, conclusion. Now 53. Okay, I think Alex, we can end the poll if you don't mind. There's now 69% of uh, the participants that have voted. So I think this uh, 
good enough for us to come to a conclusion like that. Um, and if you could share your results. Um, so we wanted to know um, your level of understanding. We can see that most people consider themselves to be in the middle of the um, of the graph, so they have gained useful information, but they still need to learn more. Uh, this is perfectly fine. Uh, we have lots of opportunities to further talk about this and learn more. So I think we can feel accomplished today that we have shared uh, a good level of information. And then scrolling down into the second question, um, how do you feel? What is your opinion about the direction that this is taking? And we get 56% of agreement in the path forward, which is definitely a very good message. And uh, of course, for those that disagree, you will have plenty of opportunities and try to help us shape this draft into one that you agree uh, more with. Um, so I think um, we can end the session now. Um, yes, I said we're going to share the presentation and the webinar recording, so that's going to be available to you. And uh, yeah, thank you everybody for your time uh, and for your patience for sitting here for two hours. <laughs> We appreciate your time and your engagement, and we hope uh, this is the beginning of uh, more contributions from your side. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Amparo. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.